Hi, my name is Don Lind, and uh, I'm the project lead for Hearts of Iron 4, a new grand strategy war game that's coming out early next year. We're here at the Arsenalen Museum, and Christer Holm is going to tell us about uh, some of the vehicles from the period. The Spanish Civil War was the war that was fought before the Second World War and was a huge one. In the war there were two different kinds of tanks participating. There were tanks from the Soviet Union with tank guns, cannons, 45 millimeters. And there were tanks from Italy and Germany, like this one, the Panzerkampfwagen Ein. They only had machine guns, so every time they fought with the tanks from the Soviet Union, they would lose if they met them head on. But superior tactics, superior command and control helped them. So in the end, that was the key to why they won the battle. And they also took over a number of these Soviet tanks. The whole war was one huge training ground and testing ground for different kinds of tactics, technology, etc. that would later be used in the Second World War. In Hearts of Iron 4, the Spanish Civil War has two major points for the player. One is the political side. It's interesting to see the side that you think will benefit you later as an ally win the war. So you might want to support those sides. And there's also the aspect of gaining combat experience by helping them out with material or expeditionary forces. You can use this kind of combat experience after the war in improving your divisional structures as well as uh, improving the arms you have so you could upgrade your tanks with better guns because you found out that machine guns don't really cut it. If you ask anyone in Russia or Ukraine today about which tank was the best tank of the Second World War, they will always answer T-34. This tank was fantastic when it came in 1940. When the Germans attacked in 1941, they didn't know this one existed. It has great armor and a sloped front, which meant that when the Germans fired their tank guns, the shells would bounce off the front. They had a 76 mm gun, which at the time was the best tank gun at all. It was a very good tank, but they also had a huge problems with it. For instance, in the United States, in Germany, they built tanks to last. You could repair them and you can continue to use them for months and years. In the Soviet Union, the approach was that this tank will only live for a couple of weeks. Then it will be knocked out on the battlefield and another tank will take its place. So everything inside here is very, very crude. They actually lost 62% of all tanks they throw into battle. It didn't all have to do with the quality of this one because it also has to do a lot with training and tactics. One of the hugest drawbacks of this tank was it had no radio. If you're going to combat in tanks and you have no radio, how will you communicate with the other tanks? By hand signals or flags? This is absolutely hopeless in a combat situation. But the Soviet approach was, as long as we win, we don't care. The Soviet Union had a lot of tank factories already before the Second World War. They had a very good industry and they had the assembly line. The problem they either had was that they had to move everything because the Germans advanced through Western Russia and they moved everything to the Urals and beyond. This is the M4 Sherman, the US main battle tank during the Second World War. Exported all over the world to the Soviet Union, to Great Britain, to Canada, etc. etc. It first entered combat in El Alamein and was superior to whatever the Germans could throw against it. This superiority was maybe misunderstood by the Americans because they thought it was going to be superior for a long, long time in the future, but it didn't turn out that way. The armor of this tank is not thick enough. It was good enough in 1942. Not good enough in 43, and actually in 1944 it was almost obsolete. The tank gun, which was initially a 75 mm gun, was very good in 42, was okay in 43, it was not very good in 1944. The problem with this Sherman was when you hit it, it burned, because the ammunition inside burned, and that led to huge casualties in the crew. But in the U.S. industry, they were very much adapted to listening to what happened in the front lines and changing the tank, because this one was very much doable to change. When it comes to production, the player is faced with the same choice as historical leaders, which is, do you keep what you have, which might be an okay tank, and you, you have geared up your industry to produce a lot of this, or do you move on to a newer technology? 
And of course, different nations settle this in different ways. And in the game, you can keep pumping out Germans and uh, kind of overwhelm the enemy. Or you can do as the Germans and try and focus on producing higher quality, but in, of course, smaller quantities. This is also perhaps a good option if you're very low on resources. When the Second World War started, the United States had 75% of all the world's car industry. So what they did was change from civilian cars to military equipment. And within a year, they went from producing thousands of civilian cars to producing thousands of tanks and trucks, etc., and almost no civilian cars. U.S. tank production didn't have any problems with getting raw material or anything like that. They didn't have to change anything. They just started performing. The U.S. produced 100,000 tanks during the Second World War. The production peaked in 1943, but already by 1942 they were above what anybody else was producing. What Krista mentioned about uh, the production capacity of the U.S. can also be done in-game. So you can convert your huge civilian industry into a military one fairly rapidly. And this is something the U.S. will have a bit of an advantage on. In Germany they had a huge heavy industry, but it didn't have the assembly line that it had in the United States and in the Soviet Union. The whole industry was more building quality in workshops. So when they started producing tanks, they produced a large number of tanks with high quality but very slow. One problem was they didn't mobilize. Germany actually built civilian cars up until 1943. That meant that German tank production did not peak until the second half of 1944, when it was already too late. They had problems with raw material, rubber, certain parts of the armor, and they had problems with Wolfram, which is one of the most important parts of building high-quality ammunition. They got it from Portugal and Spain, but when that was cut off, they had not enough to build ammunition for the tanks. So the Germans went out with high-quality tanks with low-quality ammunition that couldn't penetrate on long distances the most heavy Russian tanks that were on the battlefield. Strategic resources like Wolfram, chromium and oil are very important in the game. They are acquired either through conquest, which is going to be something more for the Axis nations, but also through trade. You'll need to have enough of these resources to be effective at producing things. So it's something that's going to be constantly on the player's mind. This is the German Panzerjägermarder 2, Marder 2 as it's called. This is one example of German ingenuity when it came to improvising. They had a large number of tanks that were obsolete by 1942-1943. They couldn't work as tanks on the battlefield, they couldn't shoot or kill Russian tanks or Allied tanks at all. So what would they do? They took them back to the factories, they took away the turrets and they put on anti-tank guns on top of these tanks. As you can see, it has no turret. The gun is situated in a combat environment on top of the tank with a small shield just to protect the crew for machine gun ammunition and shrapnel, etc. It worked. Not as a unit that you went into an attack with, but in defense and as a fire brigade, these guys were always there to try to patch up the front line. They built a huge number of these. They used French equipment, they used Czech equipment, they used German equipment. This one is a German Panzerkampfwagen 2 with a German Pack 40 on top of it. An option for nations like the, the Germans, who lack the production capacity of the US, is to modify older vehicles that might not be up to standard anymore, like for example the Marder 2 that we've seen, so that they can keep it in the fight and still keep it useful without having to completely build a new vehicle. All the countries building tanks had to use a large number of uh, specialized workers. The Soviet Union was the most mobilized country in the world. They had 54% of the workers either as soldiers or working in the armored industry. In Germany, they had a very low number of people because they didn't use a large number of the women they had and they didn't mobilize until 1943. In the United States, UK and the Soviet Union, they had more workers working for the army than they had soldiers. In Germany, it was the opposite. They had more soldiers than workers. Now we heard a lot about tanks, but that's only one aspect of Heart of Iron. We also have the other branches of the military, such as Navy and Air, which have a huge impact on the game. There's other non-military aspects, like diplomacy, politics, espionage, that affect a lot. In Heart of Iron, you're not just tied to what happened historically, but you're free to make your own choices and your own paths. So I'm looking forward to seeing what people come up with in the game.